one, two, three, four, one, two. I'm going to turn the mic over this way. <coughs> okay. First slide is blank. Mm -hmm. One, two. Good.
That one right there. Very good. Okay, let's go ahead and we'll start bringing the lights down so we can get our night vision. Appreciate you coming in spite of the weather. What we do, we're going to uh, start getting things good and dark. I'm Warren, and I want you to feel comfortable, as I feel I'm comfortable, any time as we're going through this evening, and you have a question, I prefer that you ask it then, right then. Now, you have two choices. You can call out loud enough I can hear you, and get my attention and ask your question, or if you are still from the classroom environment, go ahead and raise your hand. But I'll ignore it because it'll be dark. Okay? Now we're going to start getting it dark here. And <coughs> as we go, here's uh, what I want to show you. This is our website. And one of our uh, young men uh, here that works with us designed our website, has done an excellent job. And what you would do, you would go to this, uh, I guess you call the URL or its address, right there, www.starsatnight.org, right, which is right up there. And when you do that, this is the kind of picture that you're going to get. And so when you, as soon as you do that, then you're going to notice a menu. Now, I've noticed on the latest that the menu go and it's changed just a little bit. But this word right over here is called, is blog. And so when you click on the blog, you will see these four. And if you'll scroll down and go to this one, the one that I've been putting things on, here's what you'll come up with. You will see a list of things that have been put on there. And then what you, would do, what you can do is you can scroll down and select any one of them, of course, or however you would like. But, for instance, we'll just take this last one here, and it says Constellation Cassiopeia the Queen, pages 1 and 2. And you click on that, and here's what you'll come up with. Here is a page. This is page 1 of, of the 2. It shows the outline of the part of the sky that has been uh, designated for Cassiopeia the Queen. And then we connect the dots, the stars, and have, give you some information there. And then page two is, gives more information about uh, the specific stars, the main stars, and a lot of other information that's right in, in here. All of these that are on there, all of the constellations have their own pages. And as I have the time and, and make some changes, I'm adding more and more uh, each time there. So uh, you can do that. And then, of course, you can at your discretion, if you want, you can take and download and print that out and have your own copy. And eventually, we'll have all of 88 constellations uh, there and the pages, if you will, and if you want to either print them out, then you would have a complete set of all of the constellations that are up in the night sky worldwide. And like I said, and there's the page two. Other things are on there. Uh, just finished up as far as the moon uh, phases and the sun. Uh, also, as it tra both of them travel along the ecliptic for next year, for 2015, and that's up. And if I remember right, it's I believe it's four pages, and you can uh, go on there and get your information. 2014 is still there uh, on this website, and you can see then for the end of November 
and then of course for December. Like I said, additional things are, are added, being added uh, each time here. But let's start off and let's look at uh, for this month, this next month. And what I do is for uh, normally this is the la we do this on the last Saturday evening of each month from 6:30 to 8. However, because of holidays. We will have uh, in October, November, and December, because of Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas, we move these dates around. And as you know, this is not the last Saturday night of this month. But what I do each time is we talk about and I show you information on next month's constellations. And so we will, tonight, we'll talk and we'll look at what's going to be coming up in December. Here's our first week, which happens to start for December on a Monday, and you can see the information here. So let's take a look at each one of them. First of all, on Tuesday, uh, we have a couple things there. Uh, here we have, on Tuesday evening, we'll have our earliest sunset of the year of 2014. And later that evening, the planet Mercury enters the region in the sky that's uh, set aside or designated for Ophiuchus. And as time goes on, you'll be begin to understand that more uh, as we go. So here we have earliest sunset of the year. Now, notice also on Wednesday, what do we have? We have a full moon, but we have earliest sunset of the year. Both nights, Tuesday night and Wednesday night, both of them have, at 528, we have the earliest sunset of the year. On Wednesday, what's going to be added will be a full moon. And let's take a look at the relationship, what we have for a full moon. We're looking down on Earth. We're looking at the North Pole. Looking down on it, we're up above. And we would see then that the moon, for a full moon, will be on the opposite side of Earth from the sun. And so we would be looking at that for the, during the night, uh, from sunset to sunrise, for a full moon. And uh, we'll be watching, uh, going through the different phases as we go here uh, throughout the month. So that's a full moon. Now, the other thing we have next, we have on Thursday, we have, a notice it says that the planet Mars enters Capricornus. It's a similar thing like Mercury entered Ophiuchus. And so we have here at that time. Let's go to the next night. This is Saturday, December the 6th. And from all evening, from sunset, of the December the 6th to sunrise on December the 7th would be the best time of the year to look at the constellation called Taurus. And let's see what the, we have here. Here is Taurus the bull. And uh, we will see here, if you connect the, the, the stars and the information there, you can kind of make a bull. Now the, the, the drawing and the symbolism here, if you want to call that, comes for out of a book, uh, real good, uh, called The Stars, The Stars, by H.A. Ray. I don't know if any of you ever read or uh, that. Uh, Curious George, same author. And what he has done in the book is for each of the constellations and the stars, he connects to try to make it somewhat like what the name of the constellation is. So we have here the bull. Let me draw your attention to one uh, specific uh, thing here. Notice this right here. This is a, what we call a little globular cluster, a little cluster of stars, and it has a whole bunch of names. Here, depending on how you want to pronounce it, Pleiades or Pleiades, however you want to say it, and also it's called M45. Now the M, capital M, 
is a designation based on an astronomer back in the 1700s. His name was Charles Messier, and what he was looking for was were comets because uh, back then and even today, if you happen to be the first person who identifies a comet that has never been seen before, and you get that information, its address, we'll call it, and send that to uh, the international headquarters, the IAU in uh, Paris, France, uh, and they cross-check and they say, yep, you're the first. Well, then you get the honor of naming it, and you can name it after yourself or whatever you would like to do. So he was constantly looking for comets. He never found any. But what he would do is he would find something in the sky. Now, what, what get identifies if we looked in the sky, even with our naked eye, what, a, what gives a characteristic of a comet? What's a significant characteristic? Anybody have an idea? As opposed to just a single star. What's the difference between a star and a comet? Pardon? Can't hear you. It would have a tail. That's correct. It would have a tail. And... Another thing, it is going to move over a period of time. So we have to remember that when Messier in 1700s was looking, he was looking through a telescope with the technology being barely 100 years old. And definitely what he was using is not up to what we have today. And so uh, he would see... What we would call, what I would call, and uh, when I was in school, and in both grade and junior high and high school, we used a thing called a chalkboard, and we wrote on it with stuff we called chalk. And then when we to try to erase it, we would leave a smudge on the chalkboard. And so he was looking for kind of a smudge. And he would see, and he'd say, ooh, 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 a comet. And he would write down its address. And then he would go on and look for other things. Periodically, he would come back, and he would look in the, the same part of the sky, and he would see, and oh, maybe this is a comet. And then he'd cross-check its address with what he had listed, and he'd find it's the same thing, and it didn't move. So that's not a comet. 45, all that means is that is the 45th object that he recorded. It's not the 45th largest, farthest, biggest, or whatever. It's just number 45. Another thing, like I said, it has the name of Pleiades or Pleiades. In Japanese, what's interesting, that name, Pleiades, in Japanese is Subaru, the name of the car. So, if you will look at the logo, if you have one, or the next time you see one, or whatever, look at the logo, and you will see the six stars of the Pleiades. Now... Another one, it's also called Pleiades, it's called the Seven Sisters. Most people can see six of them. A few people can see seven, and then you can see more, but it has to be very dark, no moon, and no what we call light pollution. Here's a blow-up, if you will, of that region right there. Here we are. For M45, the Pleiades also called the Seven Sisters. If you look at it in a certain way, here, like this, that um, it does look kind of like a very small dipper. And I get a number of people, when I do this out in the open at, at night, people will say, oh, the little dipper. And I say, no, to me, that's the teeny dipper. Because we have what I consider we have four. We got the teeny dipper, 
Little Dipper, Big Dipper, and then I can show them when it's, uh, when it's up what I call the Giant Dipper. But anyway, here we have it right here. Now the glow and all this would be called a nebula. A nebula is Latin for cloud. Now it can be either gas or it could be some solid material. And we will see uh, later on as we go through, we'll see some clouds that are solid material and that uh, cuts out the visible light of what's behind it. But gas here we would see. Okay, let's look on. Here's another. Here, here this happens to be M1. This was the first thing he recorded in his uh, search, the Crab Nebula. Now, um, we'd have to figure out why he called it or why it's called the Crab. But anyway, <coughs> you can see the, the, glo the uh, gas around it, the nebula here. Okay. Give you an idea of perspective. Let's go to the second week. Now, on the second week, uh, we have here, uh, again, one of our planets. In this case, Venus is going to enter Sagittarius, the region. And then on Friday, we're going to have what's called an apogee moon. Oh, uh, what does that mean? Farthest from the Earth in the lunation orbit 1137. Well, let's see what that talks about. Our orbit of the moon as it goes around Earth, this is exaggerated. It is a circle, but it's not a perfect circle as far as a constant radius distance. It is an oval. And so there is a time when the moon happens to be in its orbit farther from the Earth than when at another time when it is closer to Earth. And so this would be called the apogee that we have here. Okay? Now also we have, if you notice, there is a constellation called Calum. Here we go, right here. Selim, right up there. The sculptor's chisel. You notice there's not a whole lot you can do. This may be the blade of the chisel or something. But it's, it's also, notice the latitude, it's below the equator. So it's getting down where we would get into the region that we're not going to be able to see it, uh, see some of the things. But we can see Selim here, uh, all of it. Okay, let's see if there's anything. Nothing there of significance. Let's go on. The Saturday, we have again another constellation on that Saturday. Dorado here, the swordfish, and the Gemini meteor shower. Let's look at both of these. Here's Dorado and the swordfish. Here we have right this. Now, the thing is, where we are, we're approximately 31 degrees north uh, latitude uh, uh, there. So as far south we could see would be approximately right along here call at about minus 59, 59 degrees south. So from here on down toward the south pole, we will never see there. And if you notice, now what we have, one of the things it says is the Large Magellanic Cloud. And this is a galaxy. There's a total, if you will, of uh, one, two, three, four, five galaxies that we can see. And we can see three of them where we are here. But these, this one we cannot see. This one is also named after Magellan, if you will, the Portuguese uh, sailor, the captain, who uh, recorded going around the world and in honor of him. And he was the first one to write down uh, that he saw this cloud in the sky. And that's what it looks like, a faint uh, uh, group of stars. And so in honor of him, that's what his name. There's a large and then there is also a small but we will see as we go on. 
Here are some of the things we can see. By the way, notice that we have, let's see, oh yeah, right there, here is this supernova SN in 1987, and there we have, and that is it right there. A new star. See the nebula that we have around it. There's also another one called the Tarantula Nebula. I guess you could try to count if you could find how many, what does a spider have? Eight legs. There we have. Here is the large Magellanic Cloud. You can see the glow of all the stars. And when we're looking at that, we're looking through our own galaxy, the Milky Way, and we're looking out beyond, and we are looking at the Large Magellanic. Now, the other thing said that there was the Gemini meteor shower. To give you a perspective, here is Gemini, and right up by Castor, right by his head, would be where you would look to watch what seems to be the meteors coming out from uh, that area or that region there in the sky. And that would be that evening. And the best time to watch meteor showers is from midnight on through the morning. Let's go on. Let's go to the next week, week number three. And we're going to have now, we're going to have a third quarter moon. You remember, we started with a full so we're going to go from the full, and as time goes on, we're coming to come to a third quarter moon. And here we have in relation again to Earth and to the sun. Next, on the next uh, evening, on Monday, we have another constellation, Camelopardalis. Uh, it's a faint one. And it's right way up close to the North Pole in the sky, Camelopardalis. And it's called the Camelopardalis, notice what it, they call it, the giraffe. Now we have to think, why in the world would they have called a giraffe a Camelopardalis? What's the first part of the word? Camel. What's the color primarily of a camel? Brownish, kind of. Okay. Well, so that was what they were familiar with. A camel is large, and so we're, we'll call this this giraffe. When they saw that creature, that, that must be related to a camel. The other thing a giraffe has, remember it's somewhat, if we want to call it, spotted. And it has light and darker uh, spots on it. And so the only other thing they could think of was a leopard. So it is a leopard camel or a camel leopard. That's what they could think of to name it that, the giraffe. And there's a few things there. Here is another, uh, what's called, galaxies are usually called an island universe. And you can see here is we're, again, we're looking back through uh, to see the, uh, the galaxy. Here's another one. Now, all of these stars that we would see here are in our Milky Way, and we're again looking through out beyond to see this right here. See the spiral arms? You can see how that uh, how it has it there. Here's another, the flaming star. Now, this would be in, uh, in our Milky Way here with us here. And uh, here is Nebula, as you can tell. Going on, we're going to have now Thursday, the sun enters Sagittarius. And 
uh, as it travels along what we call the ecliptic, its path in the sky. Let's go now to Saturday, the 20th, and we have another constellation, Origa, the chariot driver. So here we have Origa, the chariot driver. He is up closer to the north pole in the sky. You can see from the latitude here, uh, we're looking up toward the north. And the uh, main star there is Capella, very uh, bright and large star. And it's the closest uh, minus one uh, magnitude star to the North Pole in the sky. Now what's also, if you like pointer ob uh, systems to help you find things, this right here, this star Menkelinen, and this one here, Delta Origi, and this one, Theta Origi, are virtually all three are, as far as we could say with our naked eye, perfectly in line with each other, and they point directly to the North Pole in the sky. So when you can, we can see Origa uh, here uh, in the evening and at night, and you find the bright star Capella and then the three little called the lambs, if you will, the kids, and look across and find Menkelinen. There will be a faint one here, that's Delta, the faint one here, Theta. And you get these three, and you will point, help you point right toward the North Pole in the sky. And uh, good help there. Here are some things. Simeus, a supernova remnant. That's the gas, if you will, the nebula from it. Okay, now if you remember I said as we started that normally the night sky presentations are the last Saturday night of each month. However, because of Christmas, we are not go it's not going to be on the 27th. Uh, it will be on the 20th. So on Saturday the 20th in here, 6.30 to 8, we will talk about what's going to be available and to see for January. Now once we get uh, past in January all the way down to October, those will be on the last Saturday night of each month. Okay, all right, here's our fourth week. And we're going along, we're going to have in that time something uh, significant here. We're going to have that evening what's called the winter solstice. And what that is, the sun is at its southernmost declination, and the season for us in the northern hemisphere, winter begins. If you were down in South America, Australia, southern Africa, what season would they be starting on December the 21st? That would be their summer. And so they would not call it the winter solstice. What would they call it? The summer solstice. Now, <coughs> solstice is Latin. And if we took just the first three letters, S-O-L, what would you think that is? Uh, in Latin's S-O-L, what do you think that would me mean? Pardon? The sun. Okay. Now, what's about the stice, S-T-I-C-E? Well, let's think of what the sun seems to be doing as we watch it each day at, we will say, our solar noontime. And as we watch, as day by day goes along, and we're in December, we will see that each time as the sun rises in the east, comes across for our transit, uh, uh, for our solar noon, and then goes and sets in the west, it seems if we would plot it every each time, the sun slowly gets lower and lower in the sky. Now, does it continue all the time? 
Will it continue always descending lower and lower in the sky? No. It eventually stops. It stands still. And so, as we would watch, it seems like the sun is goes lower and lower and slows down and eventually it stands still in the sky and then it's going to start back up. So at that time we have what we call we would call our winter solstice that we have there. And let's take a look. At that time for the winter solstice Earth is tilted 23.45 degrees away from the sun as far as our travel. And if you see here the rays of the sun directly overhead, well, you would need to go down to into the southern hemisphere to the Tropic of Capricorn, which, let's see now, I mentioned to you how what's the tilt of the earth? 23.45 degrees, right? What do you think is the latitude of the Tropic of Capricorn? How about in the south, a minus 23.45 degrees? That's what happens. And so, we, in the northern hemisphere, we are pointed, if you will, tilted away from the sun, and we will receive then, during those days, we will receive a less amount of sunlight because we'll have more darkness through the time period, and so we will have a cooler time as far as day. We will not have as much time for our, uh, the surface to uh, warm up. It's as opposed to look down in the southern hemisphere. They're going to be, this is their summer. And that's why. Now the other thing we said on there, back up, we're going to have a new moon. And we see right here, new moon. <coughs> and it said lunation 1138. So what in the world does that mean? There we go. Lunation. Uh, is a number, and it's kept track of. An astronomer started it back January of 1923, and what he was wanting to do was keep track of how many times the moon orbited the sun in reference beginning each time from new moon to new moon. So since January of 1923, this will be the 1,000 138th time as it, uh, as it uh, rotated, 1137, and so rotation orbit 1138 begins. Now, we have another constellation, and this is the majestic one of uh, the whole season. This is worth going out and uh, look for uh, at any night we can. And so, on the 22nd, go out and look in the sky and see the mighty hunter, Orion. Now, Orion, as the mighty hunter, he faces us. We are looking at the front of his chest, if you will, right here. He does not have his back to us. This is the front of his chest. And so we would describe then, if you will, here would be up uh, his neck or and his head would be in here somewhere. This uh, Bellatrix would be his left shoulder. Uh, Betelgeist or Betelgeuse would be his right shoulder. Here we have something. Anybody know what these three stars we call? Orion's belt. Now, technically, the belt of Orion or Orion's belt technically would be called an asterism, A-S-T-E-R-I-S-M. And an asterism, I'll get that right in a little bit, an asterism means it is an object named in the sky 
that is not the name of one of the constellations in the sky. There is no constellation named Orion's Belt. Okay? Just like we had earlier, back up in Taurus, right here, the Taurus, and over here would be the Pleiades, or the Seven Sisters, if you will. That would be the Seven Sisters, or the Pleiades would be an asterism. There is no constellation called that. And so that's what we have right here. What's interesting, if you will, is this one right here, the farthest to the west, and we see in the sky, Mintaka right there, is just barely across the equator and just to the south, less than one degree. So if you are able to recognize Orion and you're outside and you can watch and you have a good flat horizon, and you see it up in the sky, and as it goes and sets on the western horizon, Mintaka, where it touches on the western horizon, will give you, if we will, due west. And if you know when it's going to rise, and you watch, and you see Bellatrix and Taurus coming up, and you keep watching, here's Rigel, and you wait, and then you see Mintaka touching the eastern horizon, what's it going to give you? The point on your horizon due east. And also, it being right on the equator is up 12 hours a night and 12 hours in the daytime throughout the year. Constantly like that. Now let's go on. We have here is Rigel. And then we have safe. So this be his left foot, his right foot, hanging down from Al Nidak here would be uh, the M42. We'll see that in a little bit. And also the star, uh, can't read right here, Saya. Uh, and <coughs> this glow we're going to see here, this we call his scabbard. S-C-A-B-B-A-R-D, which is an old English term. And does anybody know what a scabbard would be? Pardon? Okay, it, well, uh, hanging from his belt, what an, a hunter or a frontiersman would have would be a pouch where he would hang his the axe or his knife. It's a pocket pouch that hangs right there. And there we have. So let's look at this in more detail. Here is Betelgeuse to give you an idea. By the way, Betelgeuse in the winter will be the largest star you will see with your naked eye. And here is, a, of course, a close-up of it. It's a red supergiant. To give you an idea of how large it is, notice what we can do. We could put a few million of our suns inside that star. And, of course, a few, let's see, thousand, million, billion, trillion Earths in there. To give you another perspective, if that was, we were the same distance from the center of it as we are from our own sun, 93 million miles, we would say there, we would be down in here, and Jupiter's orbit is out here. We would still be inside that star. Give you a perspective. Now, <clears throat> here are the three stars, if you will, of uh, the belt. And <coughs> coming across, do you notice something right down here? This is a nebula. This is, well, let's get a close-up. Here is al Nidak, al Nilum, and al Mentaka. And this is called the Horsehead Nebula. Let's see. Let's blow it up a little bit. And this is a nebula. And this is solid material. It's not a gas. Uh, solid material. And so it cuts out, if you will, the visible what's behind it. 
and it's shaped like, uh, if you will, like a horse head, and that's why it's called that. This would be gas here. Let's back up. Hanging down, we come down, and we have M42, and this is called the Orion Nebula. And let's look at it. And here we come down. Here's the star down below, but notice that that is a gaseous nebula, and there's a star behind it that is, uh, with its radiation, is making this uh, gas, this ionized gas, to glow. And that's what is making it do that there. There's another one in there. And uh, can you see the witch's head? See her head? See her hat, nose, mouth, or chin, mouth here and chin, however you want. And that's Rigel. Here we go. There's the belt. Right, barely right there is the horse head. Right down here is the Orion Nebula. Now, where is the witch head? Well, there's Rigel. Here's the witch head over here. Okay, let's go on. Notice we said also there's something else. There is the Ursid meteor shower, and that comes from uh, the constellation of Ursa Minor. You find Polaris, go to the opposite end, if you will, of the handle, find Kochab right here, and the right just next to it is the radiant point for the Ursid uh, meteor shower. Be, be able to see that at night. Now we've gone on. Here we're going to see another constellation. Here is Lepus. And Lepus is down below Orion. Orion is right here. And down below it, right here, is Lepus that we have. It's a relatively faint in a way, but we'll be able to see it. Uh, well, this is Rigel. Here's safe. And we look down at his feet. And we find uh, Lepus. Lepus is the hare or the rabbit. Don't confuse that with lupus, L-U-P-U-S, which means wolf. And there is one that's called lupus the wolf. Here's some things from it. A super, the supernova remnant. And this gas from the explosion is uh, constantly expanding. Let's go on. We have now on the 24th, we have what we call a perigee moon. Remember we had earlier in the month the apogee? Now we have the perigee. And the way I remember between the two, I think when I see you get the word perigee, that the moon is perilously closer to the earth. Remember this is exaggerated. So we have the perigee and the apogee. The other thing, we have another constellation called Mensa uh, there, and this is too far south for us. If we drew the line, we can see down to about here, 59 degrees south, so everything here we cannot see. Remember, here's Dorado, the swordfish, here's the large Magellanic Cloud, and over here we have the small Magellanic Cloud, another uh, galaxy. And so those are two, the two that we cannot see with our, uh, from here at uh, uh, latitude uh, here in Texas at the planetarium. Now we're in our last week, and we're going to have a first quarter moon and then we'll have our final constellation. So let's take a look. We come around, and we're at the first quarter moon, and we're going, we have it there, and then we're going to have the constellation of Columba. And what's interesting about Columba, it is called the Dove, and this is the only constellation 
that is named after a biblical uh, item in, uh, in the Bible. It is named after the dove that Noah uh, loosed, if you will, from the ark. And so that's its ancient name. Now, right here, the solar ant, uh, antex, anterex, uh, this is where we are going away from uh, in our Milky Way. And there's another one, <coughs> another constellation, if we turn and look the other direction, w the direction we're going toward uh, in the universe. Okay? Now, <coughs> one of the things I've been working on, and let's see if I can, we can do that this evening. I get a question periodically of uh, why do we seem to have, <coughs> if you will, the same face of the moon uh, each night and each time throughout the year uh, that faces us. And let's see if we can, if we can explain what that is. Remember we started uh, with a full moon. We went to a third quarter, a new moon, and a first quarter for this month. Now, what I want us to do to make it simpler, we're going to start with a first quarter moon right here. Now, if you can read with me, we're going to divide the moon up into four quadrants, if you will. And so what's the letter there? A and B, and we have C and D. So, <coughs> we would have what we want to call here, if you can barely read it, we have what we're going to say is the, the sunlit side and the dark side. So, we have for the sunlit side, what quadrants? A and B and the dark side, C and D. Let's go on now, down to, what we're going to have now to a quarter, first quarter moon. And let's see what we have. What is the dark, uh, the sunlit side? What do we have here? C and D, notice, C and D. And so uh, the sunlit, and what's the, dark side. A and B. Let's go on to the next. On a full moon, what is the sunlit side? C and D, and we have A and B over here. Can you see that? And then we finally wind up, if we will, with the third quarter moon. What's the sunlit? A and C. And so what's our dark side of the moon? B and D. Okay, now let's go, and I want us to add something else as we, we go, and we're going to see what happens. What did we say is the sunlit A and B? Or the, we're going to now say we've had here the sunlit and the dark. Now we're going to add what I want us to do here, the far side and the near side. So what's the far side? in relation to Earth. A and B, and the near side to us is C and D. Let's go now to the, if we will, to the moon when we have a first quarter. What is the far side to us? Well, it's A and B. What has happened? The moon, has, as it's moving, it is slowly rotating on its axis. So in, we'll say, the seven days it comes around here, it has rotated one-fourth of its, di uh, its rotation. And so what's the far side? A and B. What's the near side to us? C and D. Let's go to the next. Well, now we come up here, and we have, for a full moon, what's the far side to us? A and B. What's the near side? C and D. Remember, it's constantly rotating. And we finally come to our third quarter as we go around. What is in relation to us? What's the far side to us? A and B. And what's the near side? C 
see and do. So what can we see in relation to this? The lit and the dark sides are constantly changing, but the near side and the far side stay the same. Why? Because as the moon orbits the earth, its rotation is synchronous with as it goes around the earth. And what causes that? The, if you will, the mass of earth makes the moon bulge just like tides, like we have the water on earth uh, is caused to bulge for tides. We have what is called a solid tide on the moon. And so the side that faces, the part that faces the earth is bulged out. It's, a tr uh, it's stretched, not a perfect round circle, but a little bit of an oval. And in so doing, that causes its rotation to slowly be in synchronous as it goes around Earth here. And so that's why we have the same face all the time when we look in the night sky. Okay? Hope that helps you get an understanding of why that is. There we go. A and B, C and D, constant. All right, uh, let's turn off the PowerPoint and let's uh, get, we have our uh, sky for tonight and we'll start with our constellations, work our way down and see, well that was a Nova, and see what we uh, can as far as our uh, constellations and we're going to start uh, from, uh, if you will, uh, should be our farthest to the north. Anybody recognize our uh, Anything in the sky right now as your eyes adjust? Okay, Orion, where is it? Here it is right here. Here is Orion. So that will give us a perspective, if you will. Now, what, starting from the north, going to the south, what is our first constellation that we have? Camelopardalus. Now it's going to be very faint, and so uh, we're going to rotate. And here, oh, by the way, I should have told you as we move it around, uh, fasten your seatbelt. If you don't have a seatbelt, grab the person next to you. Okay, here we go. Now, we should have, in relation, we should have now Camelopardalus is going to be right in this general area right here. Real quickly, let's see if we can use something to help us to find the North Star. Can anyone find the North Star right now? Let's use what we would call the asterism of the Big Dipper. Here is the handle, all right? Here is the pot pan, the dipper, what we want to do is we want to find the two stars on the pot that are opposite the side of the handle, which would then be these two. I want to measure the angle here with my hand, with my fingers. For me, at arm's length, I can put my middle three fingers right here. This is approximately five degrees angle. I want to then move my three fingers in the direction they're pointing out the top of the pot. So to me, this is the top and this is the bottom. So I'm going to move my three fingers right over here. Here's my three. I want to take this angle and I want to go in this direction and I'm going to move my three fingers five and a half times. If you want, you can count with me. Here we go. Here's one, two, three, four, five and a half, 
right there is Polaris. You see how you can find it? How many times? Five and a half gives us, will get us right there for Polaris. Now the other thing what we have up here is Cassiopeia. And the other way we would do it to help us, if we know both of these, Cassiopeia and uh, Ursa Major, the Big Bear, and in that, uh, the Dipper, we would measure across the full face of Cassiopeia. And for me, I have to put the tip of my little finger and the tip of my thumb all the way across. I want this faint one down here, which is Ca uh, Segan. And this will be my rotation point here. Can you see a faint row of stars here? All right. I'm going to keep this here, and I'm going to go from calf, and I'm going to rotate right over, and I'm going to stop right here. That little row is going to tell me when to stop. Now, if I've done it correctly, the angle from here to here should equal here to here. Now this becomes my rotation point, and I'm going to take now and do a rotation with this one, and I'm going to rotate around and come, and guess where I wind up? Polaris. Well, here's what we've done. We have said initially that the angle from Polaris to the lip star on the Big Dipper, Doobie, is five and a half times the angle from Doobie to Mirac. That's all we've done. We also said that the angle from Polaris to Segan is twice the angle from Segan to Calf. And so when we are able to recognize different constellations and asterisms and can measure with your hand or whatever in the sky, every night one of these two, or sometimes both are up, Cassiopeia or the Dipper, are going to be up, and you are able then to find the North Star. Anyway, let's find here Camelopardalus. It should be right in here. Now our uh, Killian and the others should have connected them, so let's bring it up here. Let's see where we can find the camel. There we go. Camelopardalus. Notice it's faint, but it's in this general part of the sky right here. Okay? Very good. Let's turn that one off. What's our next one? After Camelopardalus, what we should have would be Auriga, the chariot driver. So let's go to... Now we're going to rotate it around because we're going to start heading down toward the south. Okay, and here he comes. Okay, very good. Now, look up above you. Look up above. Dipper. What's over here now? Cassiopeia. Polaris. We have Camelopardalus here. Look down. Do you see the three faint stars? Here are the kids, the little lambs. And this one right here, then, is we're going to have Cass, uh, is uh, Capella. Remember, this is Menkelinen. Here is Theta. Here is Delta. The three in line are going to point to, as we come up, and we should come to Polaris. Okay, let's see if we can trace out Auriga, the chariot driver. Go ahead. Oh, okay, very good. There he is, Auriga, the chariot driver. All right. So we've had Camelopardalus. We have Auriga, the chariot driver. Who is next? Taurus, the bull. Now we're going to come down, and as we come up, we have still... We have Auriga, we're going to go down below, and we're going to look for Taurus the bull. Now, do you see the Pleiades, the cluster? Can you find them? 
right here faintly. Can you see the V or the arrowhead of Taurus the bull? Now let's trace him out. Very good. Taurus the bull. Okay. Here it is. Aldebaran, the eye of the bull. Pleiades, M45, seven sisters, Subaru, right here. And right in here is going to be somebody else. So what comes after Taurus the bull? Orion. Well, that ought to be fairly easy. Let's go to Orion. Right there. Let's go ahead with it. Tracy Mount. There you go. There's Orion. Here he is. He's got his bow or shield up because Taurus the bull has its head down. Is it going to charge Orion? We don't know. But in defense, Orion has his axe or sword or whatever up to protect and ready to uh, defend himself from Taurus the bull. Here we have the scabbard hanging down. Bellatrix, Beetlejuice, Belt of Orion, Rigel, and Safe. Okay. Let's go to the next one. What's next? Selim. Okay, let's go to Selim. Now let's trace out Selim. And we should have right here very faint as far as this. Now, it's going to seem a little different as we're going uh, here. It's going to get, we're start going to get in dark parts of the sky as we go down toward the South Pole uh, as we come down here. Notice in relation, Orion, and we have right here, Selim, Selim, the, sculptor, the, the, the sculptor's chisel, if you will. What's next? Dorado, the swordfish, and we come down. Now, before we put it up, if your eyes have adjusted, can you see kind of a smudge right here? What do you think that is? The Large Magellanic Cloud. Very good. And we should have over here the small. So we have here the large. Well, let's trace out, if you will, then the swordfish. There he goes. Okay. He jumped. We can say he jumped up out of the Large Magellanic Cloud. Okay. Good. Let's go to the next one. What do we have? Mensa. Now, Mensa is the Table Mountain, or the Mesa, if you will, M-E-S-A. It's uh, very close to the South Pole in the sky. We cannot see any of it from here. So in relation to the swordfish, where would you say it's going to be? How about down in here? Let's trace it out and see. Pretty hard. There we go. And that should be our last one, I believe. Isn't that right? That's correct. So, let's work our way back up north. What was the last one? Mensa, the Table Mountain, the Mesa. What is the one above it? Dorado, the Swordfish. Very good. Go ahead. There it is. Great. And Large Magellanic. What's above it? Selim, the Sculptor's Chisel, which should be right in here. Okay, what's next? Columba, the dove. And let's trace it out. Columba, the dove. And we go up north. What's next? Go ahead. Lepus, we didn't mention that as we skipped them over there, but that's all right. Lepus, the rabbit or the hare. Notice at the foot, feet of Orion, Lepus the hare. Okay, let's go. What's next? Orion itself. Go ahead. Go to Orion. Here we go. Trace it out. There he is. Very good. 
Who's up next? Go ahead. Taurus the Bull. Trace him. Here he is. Excellent. And who's after Taurus? Ariga the Chariot Driver, right here. There you are. And then next, and should be our last one, I believe, Tamala Pardalus. And what was what did they consider a Tamala Pardalus? A giraffe, but it's made up of the Latin names for camel and a leopard. There we are. Any questions? Good. Uh, let's see. I believe that's about our time. So uh, if there's no questions, I don't see any hands. So uh, we'll go ahead. And <coughs> we do have a movie coming up. Uh, what's the movie they're going to see? The Let It Snow. All right, before they do that, how about, uh, could we do a roller coaster? Or do you want to do it now, or do you want to do it afterward? Uh, going to do it afterward. Okay. Well, anyway, appreciate you coming. And uh, remember, uh, December the 20th, we'll do the constellations for January, and we'll start them up then. Appreciate you being here. Thank you very much.